thank you again for, for joining, joining us today for our webinar, Extreme Imaging Servicing, Service Engineering. And uh, we have a special guest today, uh, and uh, he's gonna share his story about image, imaging engineering and some of the adventures that he has encountered. Uh, his name is Brad Montaigne, and Brad, can you uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about it? Sure. Uh, good morning, everybody, uh, wherever you are. Um, yes, I'm a service engineer, and I've been working in uh, working on X-ray equipment since uh, probably pushing 30 years now. So uh, lately, I've been doing a lot of remote uh, stuff uh, up in Alaska and some other places, and so uh, um, just uh, probably going to retire, I imagine, in you know five, ten years. But uh, um, worked on everything: CT, MR, mammography. You name it. If it has x-ray coming out of it, I've worked on it. So, Very cool. Great. And um, so tell me a little bit about uh, you, you recently worked up in Alaska and uh, on imaging equipment in Alaska. And, um, you know, you think of it, Alaska, it's, it's such a, a remote, there's some remote areas, there's some big cities and you, yes, you'd imagine you know, imaging equipment in the big cities, but uh, you, you were telling me about some stories about some of the, the remote locations that you went to do X-ray QA. Uh, can you share some, some of those stories with us? Sure. Um, so Alaska is three times the size of Texas, and uh, a lot of people don't really, it's hard, even living up there, it's hard to grasp how big it is. And so um, you have most, most of medical is in Anchorage, and Anchorage is probably more than half the population in one city. And then the rest of uh, you know remote Alaska, there is X-ray clinics, a lot of tribal clinics, a lot of clinics with um, uh, that are related to you know mining or oil. And so uh, sometimes uh, some of these places I went to, like specifically the Aleutian Islands, where it takes uh, multiple days to get there, like many days. So so. Uh, um, you have to pack in your own food as well as your sleeping bag and everything. There's no place for you to stay in a lot of these places. You're literally sleeping on the x-ray machine in some places. So uh, it's it's there's a lot of gear you have to take. And every year you have to go out to these places. So it's a yearly thing to check it for the state of Alaska to make sure that the output's right and be prepared if something's wrong to fix it. So you have to carry as much stuff as you can. Um, you know, a service call out there, just the airfare to some places will be $18,000 just to go back and forth. So, yeah, it's uh, it was definitely a big challenge, but I really enjoyed it. I also like fishing and hunting. So if you go out to these places and you have downtime waiting for a flight, you can go hiking around and do some great, great fishing. So, yeah. That's perfect. That's perfect. Well, let's, um, I want to engage a little bit with our audience here and uh, and do our first poll. And uh, Maria, can you can you go ahead and launch our our first poll with our with our audience? I want to want to find out what type of X-ray equipment uh, our folks work on. So, um, if I could have everyone, we're going to go ahead and let this run for a, a few seconds. So we're getting getting some answers here. It looks like. CT, mammography, conventional, those are some of the leaders. All right, we'll give you guys about 10 more seconds here. All right. I think we're about there. We'll give you five more seconds if you haven't gotten your option in yet. All right, let's go ahead and close that poll and show it. See what see what the lead leader here is. So it looks like conventional X-ray is our our leader on this one. So Brad, tell tell me a little bit about uh, some of the the equipment that you you serviced up in Alaska. Um, I, mean, the, I would specialize in the remote areas. You know, obviously there's CT and stuff like that, but you're not going to find a CT out in the middle of nowhere. So, but uh, 
Um, conventional X-ray, a lot of times the uh, the energy, the power power sources out there, so it'd be a storage energy system or a portable. And uh, um, a lot of uh, the service calls I have are due to bad power, uh, you know, nuking things out there, and and um, and so uh, you, you'll, you'll get out somewhere and they, they won't have their call emitter light that's been out for you know two years or something. They just they just don't bother calling you because it still takes X-rays. So so. Uh, it was uh, definitely a challenge just getting all that stuff out there. But a lot of uh, like quantum systems, like smaller systems out there, uh, old GE, um, Siemens, portables, uh, Shimazu, just about everything out there. So also some very old stuff. There's some old pickers. You know, it's nothing nothing better than uh, flying for two days and you come up to some machine that's older than me. You know, <laughs> to work on it, <laughs> but but and having to fix it. You know, how does this work? You're looking at literally old blueprints that are yellowed from time that's your service manual so anyway oh wow and and some of these uh locations what what industries were the x-rays used in most of most of it it's tribal uh medical centers which you know you can think about if it takes multiple days to get in and out of place knowing if somebody has a broken bone or um, even with COVID, they're taking uh, images of chest x-rays and diagnosing COVID from there because they didn't have the test equipment in the early days of COVID. So th it was very important to that community that that x-ray machine, even though it be it just a general, you know, 300 MA x-ray machine, that it, that, it, uh, uh, that it worked. If it didn't work, they wouldn't know. It might need a life flight with Coast Guard, which is very expensive in the remote areas. Different, you know, the difference between a broken bone and you know, with something else, an aneurysm or something, it's, they're, they're, they definitely need their x-ray. <laughs> right, right, absolutely. And um, weaving in the, the RaySafe X2, which you used a lot on this x-ray, on the, on your QA um, for these machines, on, on these old obscure machines, um, you know, what, what feature helped you the most on, uh, probably, on doing probably your, a little, oops, sorry, uh, uh, no, go ahead. probably the, the biggest thing uh, it helped out is the the, sta the stability and the wave, like having waveform without taking a scope out. I don't know how many times where I looked at the waveform and the waveform was all jacked up, and I realized without you know it 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 put out KV and MA just perfectly, but the waveform had an extra pulse or something, which you know makes the image a lot a lot crisper, a lot better. It also can damage the system in the long run or the tube. So knowing that that there was an extra spike in there or whatever, uh, then you could go to more, uh, you know, advanced diagnostic and figure out what's going on and adjust it. So that was, that, that's, without carrying a scope with you, that's fantastic. So, yeah. That's great, that's great. And, um, and you know, checking with these older, older machines, um, you know, what kind, type of compliance, you know, and risk did you have with these, these older machines? Um, yeah, specifically, like in, uh, for some reason, chiropractors, man, they, they, uh, they, they'll, they'll try to keep the machine going forever. And, uh, you know, you want to help them out when they remote chiropractor, like at Dutch Harbor, like if you've seen Deadliest Catch, there's six chiropractors in that town. <laughs> so right, you're trying right. to not, I mean, if, if they, if you condemn their x-ray machine, they're out of business. So, you know, we're trying to work on some of these old things that really should be put out in boat anchors or whatever, but uh, it, you know, it, it was challenging. So, yeah. Absolutely. Well, these, you know, these, these uh, adventures up in Alaska seem, seem very interesting and, and mm. uh, uh, amazing, but um, the topic I want to move on to you, you received the, uh, we call it the, the service call of a lifetime, the Super Bowl of service calls. You know, some equipment. You found out some equipment down in the South Pole needed to be serviced, and uh, you get this call to. What was your response to to this yeah, opportunity? Well, just, just getting the call was amazing. So my my uh, my fiance is a nurse practitioner, and she was down at uh, McMurdo Station, which is down in Antarctica. She does a stint down there, and she gets down there, and their their uh, their Control X X ray machine is broken. So she, you know, she said, "Oh, by the way, my fiance just fixes that stuff." So uh, another month of getting um, physical and employed by them, you know, insurance passed and like that. I went down there and fixed the thing. So, you know, you have to fly to um, to New Zealand first, and then to uh, a McMurdo Station, which is Antarctica. You have to fly on a military C-17 flight and land on an ice floe, and then uh, and then work on the system. And by the way, the power. 
is terrible down there. So that's one of the reasons. Well, go ahead and slide. show. Uh, why don't I show show my screen here so we could sure. share with the audience? Um, oh, hold on a second. I'm I need to change myself to a presenter. There we go. There Maria, help me out there. Oh, there it is. So, oh. back to the previous one, but uh, there we yeah, go. So we had, there we go. So, so we landed at McMurdo Station. You can see that McMurdo right there. And then, uh, right. we, and then once we're there, we still had to fly to the Amundsen Scott the Pole. So people don't realize that's still a five-hour flight going across Antarctica. And it, you know, I thought Alaska was huge. Antarctica, Antarctica is on the same, uh, you know, comparison as that. And so it takes a while just getting with weather and everything going between those places. It was uh, you get you can easily get stuck for a week somewhere. So, it, but uh, it, you know, I enjoyed it. I would kind of wish I was stuck for a week or something like that. Also, it was right when COVID was coming out. So I should have just stayed there. <laughs> so, right, wow. Uh, wow. They still don't, at the pole itself, they still don't have any, any, any COVID. So, but uh, I'm sure that'll change. But. That's amazing, that's amazing. So um, you, you can't just, like you said, you can't just grab a flight down there. What? You know, you you had to go through. I mean, this is a military uh, station. What yep. what what did you have to go through just to get down to Antarctica? Um, so yeah, the C seventeen flight, uh, the U.S. Antarctic program, uh, they may, they check you out with clothes. They teach you about uh, you know uh, the cold environment, how not to not to interact with wildlife. Um, at the South Pole itself, there is no wildlife there. A lot of people don't realize that. Also, the South Pole is high altitude. A lot of people don't know. I, I didn't know that. They they give you uh, something called Dimox, which is a, a drug to help you with high altitude sickness. And if you definitely got to take that, or you'll be having headaches the whole time. Uh, one of the side effects when I was at the South Pole, I got to drink uh, you know a glass of wine, celebrate my. I, you know, fix the machine or whatever, but uh, the, the uh, side effect of Dimax, Dimox, if you drink anything with carbon dioxide, champagne, it makes it taste like sulfur. So, so uh, here I'm, a, you know, celebrated my, I fixed this thing and I got a sulfur drink. <laughs> so it was really awful. But uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the high altitude was something. It's, uh, I'm asthmatic. So uh, yeah, I, I was huffing for it to, to, to carry anything. It was definitely a brutal experience. <laughs> so, yeah. So once once you got down there, you know you you mentioned the high altitude because what what was the altitude in Antarctica? Uh, it's it, it's around ten thousand feet, but with density altitude, it's higher than that. So so it's uh wow. you know I'm a private pilot also, so ten thousand five hundred feet, you got to have oxygen on. So so uh, yeah, it's in these if you have prolonged time at that, you definitely will have headaches and, and problems. Yeah, nosebleeds from the from the from the really moist. I mean, sorry, uh, dry air that happened. I mean, it's it was rough. <laughs> it's no so picking, so still, physically, it's yeah. physically, you needed to be prepared, and uh, and then, you know, you're taking your equipment down halfway around the world and mm -hmm. uh, taking it into this equipment, you know, into this environment, making sure, you know, you wanted to make sure that your equipment was was there concerns about uh, equipment failure, you know, you can't just fly around the world and that would be uh and wind up with equipment that's that fails uh yeah that, be, that was a big that was a big concern like if i got all the way down there and my meter didn't work it'd be mm -hmm. they I, I you know I, they probably spent eighty thousand dollars getting me down there back and uh if my equipment didn't work uh you know that would be disaster <laughs> so, so right. that, i was definitely down there to make sure it was put out an x-ray and it was it was uh you know good consistent waveform and all that so yep it was, uh, they, they, uh, one note I was in the same McMurdo station, which is kind of a bigger village type of thing or camp encampment. I was, the ground was all over the place, the electrical ground. And I, I couldn't believe it. I, I thought something was wrong with my, my digital multimeter. And, uh, uh, I talked to the electrician there and he goes, oh yeah, it was a lot worse three years ago. I'm like, what do you mean by that? And he goes, well, it was so bad that we, we took an old earth mover and we, launched it off the pier into into the into the ocean with a bunch of cables uh, secured to it to increase the ground amount because it's volcanic earth and it doesn't really have a ground so i mean the the, the power waves that that i saw down there were just things 
it was unbelievable that anything worked. <laughs> so anyway. That's incredible. Yeah. Well, um, we're gonna we're gonna engage with the audience again, and uh, this time we're gonna talk about your your X-ray meter and you know what what is important about your your meter whenever you're doing QA test uh, on um, on X-rays. So, Maria, if you can launch the poll again on the second one. All right, we're getting some activity on this. Give you guys about 20 more seconds, we're, we're interesting. All right, let's go ahead and close the poll and and so it looks like seventy five percent accuracy twenty one percent real reliability, and uh, we have a few on defining a test procedure interesting. Well, let's let's uh, let's talk about that a little bit, Brad. So, um, you know, when when you're down in in Antarctica, uh, what when you're testing some of these machines, what what um, you know, we're talking about reliability on on your test equipment, accuracy. Uh, those those were the the two hottest topics. Um, what 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 helped you um, the most when you were measuring the equipment down in in Antarctica? Well, I have to say, you know, trust in your equipment and accuracy, just like everybody says. I mean, if it's if your meter's off, everything's off, and you're adjusting it to that meter. If you're adjusting the machine to a certain KV, if 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 that machine, uh, you know, if your meter's off, it sets everything off. So yes, accuracy is is key. Also, accuracy between year and year to year. You know, I'm going. I'll probably be going down there again. Uh, uh, you got to make sure that you know if, if it is a meter bearing or is that is that machine that you're working on bearing. So you know, if it's if it's a bearing, that might be an indicator of uh, something else going on or or whatever. Or whatever. So it's a really important you have consistency in your meter, even after calibration. So it should be, you know, it should be uh, the one thing that's constant is your accuracy right. of your meter. Absolutely, and um. And some of the machines, sure, sure. What what were the types of machines that you tested down? At the pole, there was min X's and uh, C, a lot of uh, control X's, which I've never worked on before until I was down there. Control X is something made in the United States, and I think it's um, sold to mostly uh, foreign markets, a lot of third world. So it's a really easy machine to work on. There's no uh, transformer tra taps or anything like that. It's self-tapping, but it's a nice little piece of equipment. But uh, yeah, troubleshooting is troubleshooting on X-ray. Doesn't the same things go out <laughs> no matter what? Right. You know, we had a tube that was not behaving right and some other things. So yeah, and obviously uh, you know greasing the candlesticks improve improve the uh, you know the M the uh, KV and just like in any machine. You know, no, normal maintenance. I don't think they have as uh, maintenance schedule as good as things in the United States, just because it's the, you know of the location. You can't go down there every year, so it costs too much. The logistics is terrible. So anyway, but. right. Well, cool. Well, a couple, couple on the person on a personal note. How did you get into to becoming a a service engineer? Uh, my my dad was a cardiologist and had a uh, his own cardiac cath lab and uh, at 16 he would call me in because I was the kid that you know took apart toasters at home and pretty soon I was working on it. yeah my son can fix this so yeah started out like that so I've been doing this my whole life <laughs> so and it, and and I really like fixing things so not cars everything else <laughs> <laughs> X-ray machines <laughs> yeah anything with electronics in it yeah everything it's electronic like, very cool yeah. well. Uh, we'll be excited to hear about uh, your next your next venture down down to uh, you mentioned possible a possible trip back down to Antarctica to a a different location and 
sounds like that's going to be an interesting uh, adventure in itself to get get down there. It's going to be on. You mentioned it's on the other side of the, yeah, the ice uh, shelf. Yeah, uh, and this is like in a, the pre planning stages, but yeah, you have to take a boat there for like multiple weeks to uh, wow. get there and back, which, which uh, I think me and my fiance, we turned that into our honeymoon. So we both like uh, <laughs> adventure. Yeah, I, you know, I met her out in the uh, the, the Aleutian Islands and you know, who meets somebody out in the Aleutian Islands? There's, you know, three people out there. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, so, but anyway. <laughs> well, exciting. Well, well, we'll have to keep in touch and, and uh find get get a get a follow up on on your adventures down there. Yeah, maybe we'll do a live remote from down there. So. <laughs> there you go. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Brad. I I really appreciate uh everyone else joining us and we do have a couple questions from our our attendees that uh cool. that have um joined us today and um so in in going um you know these customers uh, that that you worked with, you know, in Alaska or even down in Antarctica, um, you know, what kind of reporting did you have to provide? Did you did you have to provide it on site, or um, you know, how how did you create such reports? And can you share a little bit about that? A lot of remote places, I would just uh, you know have a you know spreadsheet. Uh, that if they had a printer to print it out, the X2 interfaces and has its own spreadsheet that you can make make stuff with. So I have like a you know chiropractor machine spreadsheet, and a spreadsheet for CT and stuff like that. And uh, uh, and they really like that. It looks really official. And also you can compare next the next year in they're doing uh, QC. You can compare them. Like it's find out if that tube sliding a little bit or what, what's going on. So. And, uh, but in the remote areas, uh, like the South Pole, print, getting on printers and stuff that are all government lockdown, uh, you can't really do that. So you would just uh, uh, have this uh, little form, you take notes and then populate the spreadsheet later and send them a report. So. Gotcha, perfect. Let's see, one more question here. It says, it says that, um, you say that the meters that you've used are are reliable and easy to use, um, but can you elaborate more on that? You know what makes them reliable and easy? What? Well, well, yeah, reliable. I was worried about the X2 going to 100 negative 100 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> so <laughs> at the South Pole, I mean, yeah, I, I, I doubt. Uh, you know, I love fluke and race safe, but I, but I doubt you. I doubt you guys. Uh, you know, test things to a negative 100. I mean, you shouldn't. But uh, uh, so I was worried about the cold, the batteries, if it would, it would damage the batteries permanently, um, and it didn't. Uh, the other thing was, uh, uh, you know, charging power, like, like how long the battery life was, and the battery lasted uh, plenty for what, what what I needed to do down there. So that that was important too. Also, small. You know, if everybody remembers those old nuclear associates meters, which those things are huge and carry those things around. So, you know, the uh, the X2 you can put in your pocket almost. So inside your jacket, to keep it warm when you're walking from a C-130 to the South Pole Station, which I did. <laughs> so I want to make sure that that thing, that thing worked when I arrived there. So. Very cool. Well, uh, obviously you're you're happy with the test equipment that you've been using, um, but if there's anything missing uh you know accessory or something else that would make it uh make make things e easier or or um what what might what might that be to um improve the only thing i the only thing i could think of and uh you guys already told me you can lower your brightness to improve battery life but yeah, when you go out on some of these uh, remote things in Alaska, you know, I might be out for two weeks rolling around, and it'd be nice to, if it uh, had longer li uh, battery life, you know, too. Uh, but it's it's fine the way it is. You can always, I heard you can uh, take an external battery and plug it into it, one of those external USB batteries. So, so that, right. that you know that kind of solves that problem. Yeah. I the, again, the power where I go is really sketchy. So I don't like plugging any. I, I don't like plugging anything into it, and I don't drink the water either usually. <laughs> so. I think we're we're coming to an end. Give give the folks a few minutes here. But um, another personal. What what took you up to Alaska? Um. 
I uh, we got a job. There was a job offer up there, and uh, I heard about it through the grapevine. As mm -hmm. all your X-ray guys know, everybody talks to everybody, and I heard there was a job, and it was, that was totally for me. So I like to I go up there anyway to fly fish and stuff. And I, could, and, uh, I, I really wouldn't have left um, after COVID. We had to come back and take care of some family things, and so i have uh, now in Michigan. But uh, um, you know, I'll probably get back up to Alaska again. So I really like it up there. Right. So it's definitely on my bucket list to get up there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, very good. Well, I think I think we're gonna wrap it up a little early today. But again, thank you, thank you so much, Brad, for for joining us and sharing your sure. stories. And um, and thank you everyone else for for taking time out of your day to join us and listen to Brad's story here. Um, again, this webinar has been recorded and. We'll uh, we'll be sending out an email out in the next couple of days with the the recording, so you could share with your colleagues, watch it again. And um, again, I just want to thank everyone. Thank you, Brad, and uh, everyone have a great remainder of your day. Okay. See you guys. Thanks. All right. All right. Bye now.